Good afternoon and welcome back to Downing Street for today's coronavirus press briefing. I'm joined by Professor Steve Powers, the National Medical Director of NHS England. And before I turn to our vaccine delivery plan, which we've published today, I wanted to go through the latest coronavirus data. As we know, the new variant of this coronavirus is highly contagious and it's putting the NHS under very significant pressure. Yesterday, 46,169 positive cases of coronavirus were recorded across the whole of the UK. And as the slide shows, 32,294 people are currently in hospital with coronavirus. That's across the UK, and as you can see, that is up sharply, on, even on just a week ago. It's up 22% on this time last week. The average number of deaths reported each day over the past week is 926. And our hearts go out to the family and the loved ones of each and every person who's died with coronavirus. As the Chief Medical Officer said earlier today, we're at the worst point in this pandemic. And you can see that from this slide and from the increase in number of people in hospital. So the NHS, more than ever before, needs everybody to be doing something right now. And that something is to follow the rules. And now I know there's been speculation about more restrictions. And we don't rule out taking further action if it's needed. But it's your actions now that can make a difference. Stay at home. And please reduce all social contact that is not absolutely strictly necessary. That's what's needed. Act like you have the virus. And it's all the more important to do all of this because the vaccine rollout is now proceeding at pace and we all know that this is the way out of the pandemic. I'm determined, as I have been for almost a year now, to drive this vaccination programme as fast as is safely possible. I'm determined to ensure every adult in this country has the chance to be vaccinated and that as many people as possible take up that chance to be vaccinated. And vaccines are important, and I care about vaccines, because I want our country to get back to normal as fast as possible. I want us to have that great British summer. And my team and I are working hard to deliver this as fast as possible, both to save lives and to make people safe and to protect the NHS and reduce the very significant pressures it's under right now. I wanted to bring you up to speed with the very latest statistics on vaccination. So far, across the UK, we've given 2.6 million doses to 2.3 million people. And we've protected more people through vaccinations than all other countries in Europe put together. Today, uh, I'd like to take you through the details of our UK vaccination delivery plan that we've just published. It sets out how we will build on the work that's been done so far and put in place the biggest vaccination programme in British history. There are four parts to the plan. The first is supply. I've always believed that British science would come and find the solutions to get us out of this. For a year now, we've been working to develop and buy vaccines for everyone in the UK. Thanks to our investment in Ebola and MERS vaccines several years ago, the Jenner Institute at Oxford University was able to repurpose the work that it was doing and move so fast to develop a successful coronavirus vaccine. But our search has been global throughout. So whilst we've backed the scientists who are working on this here at home, uh, we've also worked with international partners like Pfizer and BioNTech to ensure that we were the first country in the world to authorise and use the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And of course the Moderna vaccine is now authorised and ready to bring on stream. I want to thank everybody who's been involved in this, but the work is not yet done. The supply of vaccine is the current rate limiting step and we will bring forward as much vaccine as becomes available and we must ensure that we have the vaccine development and manufacturing capabilities in this country for the future too. The next part of the plan is prioritisation. This has been much discussed. 
The plan sets out how we prioritise the vaccine so that we can protect those at greatest clinical risk. And one simple statistic explains why this is important. The top four priority groups account for 88% of the deaths from COVID. This stark fact explains why we must prioritise according to clinical need to save lives and because that is the fastest route to safely lifting restrictions. We're on track to deliver on our pledge to offer a first vaccine to everyone in the top four cohorts by the 15th of February. And I want to give you an update on progress. Two fifths of over 80s have now received their first dose. Care home residents are of course in the very top priority group. In the last few days since the Oxford vaccine was approved for use in primary care on Thursday morning, we've significantly accelerated the care home vaccination rollout. Almost a quarter of older care home residents have now received their first dose of the vaccine. And we're committed to reach every care home resident this month. And I want to see as much as possible of that as soon as possible. I'm incredibly grateful to everybody working in social care, and whether in care homes or in domiciliary care, for everything that they're doing to keep the people who are the most vulnerable to COVID, to keep them safe right now. This is not easy, but it is vital. And it's vital too that when the vaccine reaches your care home, that everyone, everyone, residents and staff alike, step forward and get that jab. Each of these jabs saves lives, and we're making this happen as fast as we can. The plan sets out how we'll continue through the clinically prioritised groups and beyond so all adults can be offered a vaccine by the autumn. The third part of the plan is expanding where you can get vaccinated. As of Friday, 96% of the population in England live within 10 miles of a vaccination site and we're expanding the number of vaccination sites further right across the whole of the UK with the devolved NHS responsible for delivery in each of the three devolved nations, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. This expansion will include community pharmacy and roving vaccination centres on top of the hospitals and GP practices and the seven mass vaccination sites that we've opened, uh, including the one I visited earlier today at Epsom. This huge expansion means that by the end of January, everyone will live within 10 miles of a vaccination centre, either fixed or roving, in England. And this will help us make sure that everybody can get access to the vaccine that's so important. And the final part of the plan is about the people who are making it happen. Over the past few months, we've recruited and trained an 80,000 strong vaccination workforce. I'm incredibly grateful to all those who've stepped forward, including people from all parts of the NHS, retired clinicians, pharmacists, airline cabin crew, and the armed services, St John's Ambulance and the Royal Voluntary Service, and so many volunteers who've come forward for their country. Thank you for your service. And I'm very grateful for the many offers of support we're receiving right now, and for all those who are in training as this vaccination rollout expands. So that is the vaccine delivery plan. It is an incredibly piece, important piece of work. But while this crucial work takes place, each and every one of us must keep pushing back against this virus by following the rules that are in place. Please do your bit and help keep the NHS strong while we roll up our sleeves and make this ambitious plan a reality. So please, Stay at home to protect the NHS and save lives. We're now going to hear a few words from uh, Professor Powers before taking questions from the public and then from the media. Thank you, Secretary of State. Uh, so like you, this morning I had the opportunity to see firsthand the next phase of the development of the NHS's rollout of the mass vaccination programme across England. Like you, I met staff in Epsom as they offered the vaccine to some of the hundreds of thousands of people most at risk of COVID-19, who are this week being invited to get a jab. Epsom Racecourse is one of seven large sites across the country opening this week. 
bolstering the ranks of the GP surgeries and hospitals which have been delivering COVID vaccines since the beginning of December. These services will be joined later this week as pharmacy-led sites begin to come online, giving us more than 1,200 settings in England that people can come to get their jab. As you've heard, more than 2 million doses of the vaccine have now been given out in England. And today, again, as you've heard from the Secretary of State, a detailed strategy has been published outlining our plan for continuing this important momentum. And as Sir Simon Stevens, Chief Executive of NHS England, said earlier today, we're in a sprint from now to February as those top four priority groups are offered uh, their vaccination. We'll then kick off another sprint up to April as we get the rest of the vulnerable groups protected and then finally a marathon to the autumn as we deliver vaccination to everybody else. Alongside social distancing and following the hands, face and space advice, these vaccines are our best line of defence that we have uh, as we continue this battle against coronavirus. And as the Secretary of State has said, the public should be in no doubt that this fight is tougher than it has ever been. Since Christmas Day, there are 13,000 more patients in hospital with COVID-19. And less than a fortnight into 2021, the number of people in hospital with COVID has already gone up by a third, a rise of around 8,000. We are seeing stubbornly high levels of infection and unfortunately death too, which is a sadly inevitable consequence of the rapid spread of the virus in recent weeks. Hospitals throughout the country are now seeing significant and sustained pressure from those rising numbers of COVID-19 patients. Even in the area of the country with the lowest number of patients, the South West has more people in hospital now than the entire country combined did at the end of September. And with hospital admissions typically occurring around two weeks after transmission of the virus, we're still to see the full impact of the Christmas loosening of restrictions reflected in those hospital numbers. So in short, as the Chief Medical Officer and the Secretary of State have said, this is an extremely serious moment for the country. And as good news as the vaccine is, it cannot be seen by any of us as a free pass to ignore the national guidance. So as we mark another important milestone in the rollout of the vaccination programme, today we have to keep our focus and our resilience as a country. I know from talking to my colleagues throughout the front line of the NHS that in their response to the coronavirus, they are incredibly grateful for the outpouring of support and praise that they have received during the last year. But I know too that the best way to thank those magnificent, hard-working staff for their efforts, and most importantly, the best way to save lives, is to continue to follow the guidance. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now go to the uh, to members of the public. And the first question, uh, by video, is Beverly from London. Now that children are going to have to learn online, can I ask how the families that cannot afford laptops or computers are going to be supported? Uh, yes, this is an incredibly important question. And my colleague, Gavin Williamson, the Education Secretary, is sending out over half a million laptops and making sure, as much as is possible, that those laptops get to the people who need them who won't be able to afford a laptop so that a child can engage in online learning. We all know that the, uh, the restrictions around pupils going to school, the closure of many schools, except of course to the children of uh, key workers uh, who need the children to be in school so that they can get to work. We know that that is a really a difficult thing to have done uh, and I hope that this provision of laptops will help to make sure that everybody can get the education that they need as much as is possible. And of course, we'll get the schools open again as soon as it's safe to do so. Thanks, Beverly. Uh, next question is from Elaine in uh, Glasgow. At what point during the UK's vaccination drive will the government determine that enough vulnerable people have been vaccinated and allow lockdown restrictions to start being eased and then finally lifted? 
This is an absolutely um, key question, Elaine. Uh, Elaine. It's the central question that, um, that, that so many people ask. Uh, and I'll explain how we're going to go about answering that, because obviously we can't, as of today, give an answer in terms of dates. Um, but we can see, and you can see in the plan that we've published, that 88%, so nearly 9 in 10, of the deaths have occurred amongst people who are um, either over the age of 70 or clinically extremely vulnerable uh, or health and social care workers, so the top four groups. That's why we're uh, going so hard to ensure that they all, all have the offer of a vaccine and as many as possible take up that offer by the uh, 15th of February. Um, then I very much hope we will see the number of deaths from this disease coming down. But those who are in their uh, 60s, so those who are younger than uh, those top four cohorts, are also, also although they also can uh, die from COVID, of course, they also are a significant proportion of those in hospital and the pressure on hospitals. So we've got to make sure that we get them vaccinated as fast as possible uh, too, and we will monitor very closely the impact of the vaccination program on hospitalizations and on the pressure on hospitals right across the UK. Now the lifting of restrictions will of course be a decision for each of the devolved administrations and for the UK government here in England, um, and so it will be a, a decision for the Scottish government uh, in Glasgow, where you are, Elaine, uh, but it's something that we talk about all of the time, trying to, trying to know when we'll be able to say more and set out more uh, in uh, detail than what I've just said to you now, uh, which essentially is the summary of how much we know. There's one fact that we don't know yet either that is critical, and then I'll ask um, uh, Steve to uh, describe the, um, the risks in terms of hospitalisations. There's one fact we don't know, which is we know that the vaccine reduces your chances of getting COVID and then of being hospitalised or dying from COVID, um, and we know that it gives you that protection. What we don't yet know, but we are following very closely, and there's, a, there's detail set out in the plan today, uh, is how much you, tra you might transmit COVID, even if you don't suffer from the disease, um, after you've had the vaccine. We hope that it, we very much hope it has a significant downward impact on that transmissibility uh, after you've been vaccinated and it's something that we are monitoring and in fact we're testing people for after they have had the had the vaccine this is called the pharmacovigilance strategy and uh, there's a there's a full paper on that that's being published alongside the vaccine and deployment plan today um, steve i don't know if you've got anything to add yes thank you elaine and as the secretary of state has said we are prioritizing the vaccination of those people in those first high priority cohorts because those are the people who are at greatest risk of dying, unfortunately, but they are also the groups who are uh, most at risk of having to be hospitalized. And so it is the case that as the vaccination program builds momentum and rolls out to more in those groups, we will inevitably begin to see a reduction in hospitalization. But we're not going to see that now. We're not going to see it next. We're not going to see it next week or the week after. It won't be until we get to February that we will start to see the early signs of that. So the vaccination program gives hope, but to battle the virus today, we have to comply with the guidelines that are in place. It's that that compliance that will get us through the next few weeks of January and into February, and then we can start to see the benefits of the vaccine program in hospitalizations and in reduction of deaths. Thank you, Elaine, and thank you for your question, which is the central question uh, that we all need to, I think, keep uh, discussing and keep watching the data to see the impact of this vaccine on the number of deaths and the number of people in hospital. Thank you. The next question is from Fergus Walsh at the BBC. Fergus. Thank you. You've got five weeks to reach a further 12 and a half million people with their first dose of COVID vaccine. Is that doable? Yes, we're on track to meet that target. It's an ambitious, stretching, but achievable target. And I'm confident that we're going to do it. And the reason I can be confident is that 
since Thursday when we uh, rolled out the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine through primary care, which is the biggest part of the rollout plan, uh, we've seen the rate of vaccination increase to 210,000 a day on average. So that's over the last, uh, the last four days, not including today, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it includes a weekend. Um, and the, um, uh, the rollout will increase further because of the mass vaccination sites that we've opened today. Um, so we've got a continued increase in the rate of vaccination. Uh, this is happening right across all four nations of the UK and it, is, uh, it means that we are on track uh, to meet that uh, target. It's not going to be easy, but we are, uh, we're going to get there. Confident? Yes, I'm confident. Uh, Fergus, uh, you, uh, like the Secretary of State and I, were down in Epsom uh, this morning. I know you saw the vaccination centre down there. I know that you were impressed by the organisation uh, because you have uh, written how impressed you were. Uh, and so I think uh, we all have confidence that the NHS can, uh, can uh, stand up to this challenge and can deliver it. Of course, we stood up the hospital hubs in, uh, in December with the Pfizer vaccine. We then had the GP hubs rolling out during December. A big boost with the AstraZeneca coming on stream last week. And again, you and I were in Oxford to see that happen. This gives another boost, another gear change. And of course, community pharmacies coming on stream uh, later this week uh, is another gear change again. Uh, so for all those reasons, as I've said many times, we get the supply delivered to us. The NHS will get the, uh, that supply of vaccine jabbed into people's arms as quickly as we possibly can. It's in all our interests, for the reasons I've given, to speed through uh, those high priority groups. Thanks very much, Fergus. Uh, Emily Morgan, uh, ITV. Thanks, Secretary of State. Um, you say you don't rule out tightening the restrictions, but judging by the uh, behaviour of people over the weekend, isn't now the time to act and make the rules stricter? Well, the most important thing about the rules is that people need to follow them. Uh, and that is absolutely critical and you can see from the state of the NHS why that's so important. So stronger enforcement is necessary and I'm delighted that the police are stepping up their enforcement but it isn't just about the government and the rules we set or the police and the work that they do, it's about how everybody behaves. I applaud the action Morrison's has taken today in the supermarket. They've said that they will not let people in without a mask unless unless they clearly have a medical reason that's the right approach and i want to see all parts of society playing their part in this so yes of course we're we we keep these things under review and we've demonstrated that we're willing to tighten the rules if they need to be tightened but the thing that really matters right here right now is that everybody follows the rules as they are today and everybody can play their part in doing that Laura Bundock from Sky. Um, Secretary of State, earlier today the Prime Minister warned about complacency at this dangerous moment in the pandemic and yet nearly three weeks ago he was allowing people to socialise indoors over Christmas. Was that complacent and are we paying the price for that now? Well we're seeing that the new variant of the virus is incredibly transmissible, it's contagious, highly contagious and the fact that it spreads so so easily from one person to the other means that we have this incredibly difficult few weeks ahead of us. Whilst we get the vaccination plan rolled out, as we were just discussing, and, and it's imperative that everybody not just follows the rules, and not just sees the rules as a limit that should be stretched, but rather behaves as if they have the virus and limits the amount of social contact that everybody has. And I know that's difficult. I, Honestly, I really do. Uh, but it's so important uh, for everybody. And so don't flex the rules. I've said before that a flex to the rules can be fatal. And what I mean by that is if people push the boundaries of these rules or don't take them seriously, then that can lead to more infections and that can lead to more deaths. And the vast majority of people are following the rules, but it's very, very important that everybody does. Steve? Yes, and I think one thing that it's really easy sometimes to forget is that as the NHS gets under more pressure from increasing numbers of patients with COVID, 
it's not just those COVID patients uh, where services come under pressure, it's patients who don't have COVID as well become affected because the ability of the NHS to provide its full range of services becomes more and more difficult. So when the public, when all of us comply with these measures and really pay attention to the detail of complying with them, then we're not just helping our NHS staff treat COVID patients, but we're helping our NHS staff ensure that they can treat patients with strokes, who have heart attacks, who are in traffic accidents. So it's really critical at this really serious moment that we all pull together uh, to ensure not only we reduce deaths from COVID, but that we ensure that the NHS is to do what it's always done for all of us, which is to treat us and keep us safe at our time of need. And I just want to come back to the core of the question that you asked. You know, this new variant makes this so much harder, but it doesn't just make it so much harder for, for, for us at the podium. It makes it harder for everyone because it means that everyone has to, has to restrict the things that they love more than would have been previously uh, necessary under the, under the old variant. And that is tough on us all, but thankfully we've got this way out with the, with the vaccine. So let's not blow it now. Uh, thank you, Laura. Next question is Kate Ferguson at The Sun. Hello, Mr Hancock. Can you clear up the rules for us, please? Am I allowed to go for a walk in the park with a friend and get a takeaway cup of coffee? Yes or no? And if yes, why are police finding people for doing that? Related to that, is it all right to go ahead and exercise seven miles away from your home? And a question for Professor Powers, if possible, please. Um, Professor Powers, are vaccination centres open long enough in the day to really turn to a 24-7 vaccination model? Um, the PM spoke earlier today said there wasn't a clamour for that, but do you agree with them? And also, would you, do you have any words for the Sun's Jabs Army campaign, which is getting people to volunteer to help roll out the vaccine? Thanks very much. I'll take the first few parts and then pass on to uh, uh, Professor Powers. Um, yes, you can go and exercise in the park with one other person, but only one other person. And we've been seeing large groups, and that is not acceptable. And you should be two metres apart from the other person. Um, and you know this is one of those one of those rules where if too many people keep uh, uh, breaking this rule, uh, then we are going to have to look at it. But I don't want to do that because for many people, being able to go for a walk with a friend, that especially if they live on their own, that often is their only social contact. So we don't want to have to change that rule. Uh, and it's very important that people don't, as I say, flex and try to push the boundaries of it. Um, it is okay to go for a walk with one other person around a park, but you should stay two metres apart from that other uh, person. And likewise, it is okay to go if you went for a long walk and ended up seven miles away from uh, home. That is okay, but you should stay local. You know, you should not go from one side of the country to another taking the potentially taking the virus with you because remember one in three people who have the virus don't know they have it because they have no symptoms and yet still pass it on so uh, it is okay to go for a long walk or a cycle ride uh, or exercise but stay local um, and please get out there and have uh, take exercise because it's good for you it's good for your physical and mental health but don't say that you're exercising when really you're just socialising, go and do exercise with somebody else because that's, that's what the rule is there for and it's there to support people and we really don't want to have to, have to tighten that further. Um, I'm just going to say one thing about 24-7, which is that you know, we'll do this if it's needed, absolutely. We'll do whatever it takes to get this vaccine uh, rolled out as fast as possible. Um, the thing is that if, if, if both the person doing the vaccination and the person being vaccinated would both prefer for that to happen in the middle of the day rather than the middle of the night, uh, then that's probably when we should do it. Uh, but there are groups, uh, night shifts for instance, where it might be uh, the best approach uh, and um, you know, our, our attitude on the vaccine rollout is, is whatever it takes to do this as fast as safely possible. Yeah, yes, I, I'm sure for the vast majority of people, they would prefer to have their vaccine during the day. And of course, for the most efficient and the best use of our staff and volunteers working uh, through the day, 
uh, is the most efficient way of delivering the most vaccines. So, so the strategy for this is, as we have said, to open as many centres in as many different settings as we can, uh, that we can. So that includes hospital hubs, it includes GP uh, centres, it includes these large-scale vaccination centres such as Epsom Racecourse that we've opened today, and it will include uh, shortly community pharmacists. So I think that will give the vast majority of people a range of choice as to where they can most conveniently and uh, most closely get their, get their vaccination. And, and frankly, that is the best way to maximise the number of vaccines uh, that, we, uh, that we're able to give. Uh, apologies, I just lost the audio on the second part of your question, which I think was about volunteering. Could you just yeah, repeat sorry. it? I just think if you have any words for the Sun's Jabs Army campaign, the campaign to get Brits to volunteer to help roll out the vaccine. We've had over 22,000 sign up so far. Well, we are extremely grateful for the work everybody's doing, including the Sun, in getting volunteers uh, uh, enthused to come and join us. Uh, we've had around 80,000 people coming forward, and there are still more uh, wanting to come. So uh, the more that we can get, uh, enthused with us in delivering the largest vaccination programme uh, that the NHS has ever delivered, uh, the better. So a huge thanks. Thanks, Kate. Come and be a part of it. The Sun's Jabs Army is marching and helping the nation. Uh, great stuff. Um, next question is from Dan Bloom at The Mirror. Good evening, Mr Hancock. Um, can you guarantee to people that the support and childcare bubbles will not be removed in any tightening up of lockdown? I understand you're in the habit of um, not ruling things out, but many people have come to rely on this specifically, and they're waiting quite anxiously to see if that will be allowed. Yes. And uh, so, Professor Powis, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, have you had any reports of anyone um, catching coronavirus on their way to or from a vaccination appointment or while waiting for it? And given we've seen people um, queuing outdoors and we've got these 50 mass centres opening by the end of the month, um, can you explain and reassure people what measures you have in place to make sure that's not a risk? So I can rule out removing the bubbles that we have in place. The childcare bubbles, the support bubbles are very important and we're going to keep them. I, I know how important they are to people uh, and um, they're an important part of the, uh, uh, of the system that we've got to support people whilst also having these, these tough measures that are necessary. Um, the, um, the, the, the bubbles are there for, for individual specific people. So, for instance, if you've bubbled with somebody, that is the person you've bubbled with. You can't keep moving bubbles. It's very important. So they're essentially become somebody in your uh, bubble, essentially becomes uh, effectively part of your household. So it is important people stick to the same bubble, but the bubbles policy will stay. And I'm really glad that you asked that question because I know there's been some... Uh, media discussion of it and I wanted to be absolutely crystal clear about that and I'll ask Steve to answer the second part of the question. Yes all, all the centres that we have set up to vaccinate whether it's those large-scale vaccination centres the GP uh, led hubs uh, or the hospital hubs uh, have all uh, put in place the appropriate infection prevention and control uh, to ensure that the, they minimise uh, the risk of any uh, spread uh, and also are putting in place the appropriate social distancing uh, so that people are uh, staying apart and the risk of transmission is as low as possible. And, and certainly down in Epsom uh, this morning, I talked to them about ensuring that uh, people weren't going to be queuing uh, in the cold and they had their systems in place to ensure that wouldn't happen uh, and socially distanced areas that they could use uh, if, they, if they needed to. Uh, or people contracting virus on their way to the centre? Uh, I, no, I think um, if you are coming uh, to a centre, um, take all the, the social distancing precautions uh, that you would take if you were, if you were travelling outside uh, anyway. Uh, so I think if, if people act sensibly, uh, as I'm sure they will, uh, those centres are set up to protect people, to ensure that the risk of any transmission is, is uh, minimised. Uh, so come and have the vaccine. That is the way that you will protect yourself and others uh, from this terrible virus. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, final question is from Jerry Scott of the Yorkshire Post. Hi, Jerry. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, the Yorkshire Post and its sister titles today backed calls from more community pharmacists to get them 
on board to deliver the vaccine locally and with the images we've just heard about of you know elderly people queuing outside vaccination centres are you looking to speed up bringing more community pharmacists on board than the 200 already announced so that everyone has a vaccination centre within say 10 minutes rather than 10 miles or is that vaccination supply issue you were talking about earlier causing a barrier to you bringing those online as quickly as you might like? Well, absolutely we're looking to what more community pharmacy can do. The first 200 community pharmacies are, as um, Professor Paris set out, coming on stream uh, very shortly, but I'm sure that there's more that community pharmacy can do. I'm a huge fan of the role that community pharmacy plays, uh, especially so close to the community so often. Often it's the bit of the NHS that is most embedded in the local community. Of course, GPs and primary care are as well. Uh, but uh, community pharmacy uh, plays that role and is probably the most, uh, the most embedded. Now, that means that especially when we're, when we're coming to make sure that as many people as possible get the vaccine, um, at the moment, you know, we've started with the, with the big numbers, but we're going to have to get the vaccine out to people either who find it difficult to travel um, or who are uh, uh, less certain that they want the vaccine and persuade people to take the vaccine. And I think that community pharmacy will have a particularly important role in that stage of the campaign. So they're, they're an important part, they're important partners in this. Um, we've, we're starting the rollout, but there's much more to come. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you all for your questions. Uh, that concludes today's coronavirus briefing.